Good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Um, hello from Switzerland. I hope you're all safe wherever you are in the world. And uh, so, so we live in an era of unprecedented change and transformation. And in the current setup with the COVID crisis, of course, everything is kind of incredibly complicated in the world. And the current crisis puts us humanity uh, at a test fundamentally. And, and in some way, what sets this crisis apart from other crises is that affects us all collectively. And, and as a result, in order to tackle the crisis, like other major crises around the world, we, we need to look at this in a very holistic, multi-stakeholder manner. And also, in order to combat and tackle this crisis, we need to ultimately think about the different stakeholder groups who have to be involved in, in driving the solutions, which are NGOs and entrepreneurs, enterprising families, philanthropists, but at the same time also, of course, governance and, and international organizations. And so, so among this multi-stakeholder effort, philanthropic families play a critical role, a pivotal role. And we find that in this multi-stakeholder effort, enterprising families and philanthropic families are uniquely positioned to, to contribute to, to solving this crisis, but fundamentally any crisis really in the world. And, and today's webinar is, is really focused on family philanthropy. So, so this is the essence of, of the webinar today. So my name is Peter, Peter Fogel. I'm professor of family business and entrepreneurship here at IMD. Um, I'm also the director of the Global Family Business Center, and I hold the Debio Farm Chair for Family Philanthropy, which is the, the core of, of today's webinar. Um, I'm very excited to have Maria austrum bondestam with me today, who's a very enthusiastic, passionate philanthropist, who will be the focus of attention, of course, during the webinar today. Um, Maria, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Maria Austrian Bundestam. I'm uh, a member of the Austrian family here in Finland and the co founder and chair of the Eva Austrian Foundation. And at the moment, honestly, a bit nervous, but here we go. Thanks a lot, Maria. Great to have you. We also have Malger Zata with us, who's a research fellow um, in the Debio Farm chair, working with me on the various philanthropic research projects we have going on and she will also play a role in the webinar interacting with you also on the Q&As. Uh, Margaret, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hello everybody, as Peter mentioned, um, I work um, as the research fellow at the Debbie Farm Chair and I had already had the pleasure to speak with some of you about your philanthropy and um, in, in, in the purpose, for the purpose of our uh, research project. And so welcome everybody again and, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, webinar. Thank you. Super. Thanks a lot. So, so what is today's webinar about? I think we want to cover a number of things, and that's why this hour is also relatively uh, short in some way, but it's the beginning of a conversation we want to start with uh, all of you in some way. Um, on the one side, we want to talk about family philanthropy uh, and the rise of family philanthropy. We want to talk about and share some insights about the research we're doing uh, with philanthropic families and in particular uh, a new framework that we're working on based on a research project that we, that we conduct together with the uh, Family Business Network and, and many of the member families from that network. We're currently writing a book around that framework which will be released later this year so we'll give a sneak preview into this framework. And then, of course, we, we will be talking about Maria and the case of the Eva Alström Foundation, which I think is a quite unique story. And um, Maria is also one of the cases that we're featuring in, in our book and in the research. Um, we'll have time for, for discussions and Q&A. And in terms of functionalities, you, you will see if you, if you play around with the navigation system a little bit, you will, you will see that there is a button called Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, please put these questions into the Q&A. If you read through the questions and there's any question you, you like, you can, you can click like and, and you give a thumbs up and these questions will rise to the top. So we can pick those questions up towards the end of the webinar. 
Um, also, Marzanta will be responding to some of the questions in real time uh, during the webinar. And um, so we'll try to kind of maneuver uh, in that manner uh, throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A um, function of the webinar. We want to start uh, with a quick poll to understand a little bit uh, who's in the room. And uh, so, so fundamentally, we want to know, are you or is your family philanthropically active? Um, and you have four options. I'll launch the poll in a second. Yes, we have our own foundation. Yes, but we don't have our own foundation, but we give to other foundations. Um, no, we don't, but we're considering getting philanthropically active or launch the journey. Or no, you're, you're not philanthropically active. So these are the options. Just very quickly, you will see the uh, poll launched here. Um, so, so please select uh, what category you fit in and then I'll share the results. Just very quickly, so we're at 50% already, that's great. I'll give it a few more seconds. We're at 75%. 85% at 90, I'll stop. Two more seconds. Okay, very good. So here you see the results. So, so we have about a third of you are philanthropically active through your own family foundation. In fact, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty large proportion of the participants. That's great. 17% um, of you are philanthropically active, but not through your own foundation. 15% are considering getting started with the philanthropic journey. And, and about a third um, of you are not philanthropically active. Maybe yet. Okay, thanks a lot. This is just to, to get a bit of a feeling uh, who's in the room. So, so about half of you are philanthropically active and, and half of you are not or not yet. So let me just give you quick a bit of background of the work that we do at the uh, Debio Farm Chair. Um, so the Debio Farm Chair was launched in 2017 uh, after the, the family behind the Debio Farm group endowed the chair to say, we want to foster philanthropy amongst enterprising families. Uh, after having been in one of our family office programs, they said, we, we think this is an important topic and we would like to support education and research in those areas. So the mission of our chair is essentially is to improve the understanding of family philanthropy. It's a very specific area. It's not so much philanthropy in general, but really family philanthropy, how philanthropy ties in to what we call the family enterprise system and, and what role it plays for the family as well. So our activities are around research, teaching, but also outreach and, and advocacy. And, and of course, you know, we, we want to be recognized as, as one of the leading hubs around the areas of family philanthropy. There are, as a matter of fact, only very few centers uh, focusing on this, on this specific topic. Of course, there's a lot of work going on on philanthropy in general, but family philanthropy is, is quite a niche topic. So, so this is, a, in, in essence, the visualization of how we see the world. This is a framework um, created by, by my colleague, John Davis from, from Cambridge, who uh, looks at not only a family business, but a family enterprise system. And, and philanthropy is one integra integral part of the system you know, more complex, multi-generational families are oftentimes diversified in terms of activities, businesses they operate, maybe with a family office, but many are also philanthropically active. And that is in some way also the target that we're focusing on in the work we do uh, to, to not only understand what is it that these families are doing in terms of philanthropy, but, but also what is philanthropy doing to these families and, and what is the contribution of philanthropy to the family in terms of governance and succession, transfer of values, etc. And what we see is that, that as a matter of fact, philanthropy plays a quite critical role for enterprising families. So it's not just that philanthropic families play a critical role in tackling the world issues, philanthropy also serves a very intrinsic purpose inside the family. 
On the one side, it's oftentimes leveraged as, as a mechanism to onboard the next generation, to, to kind of get them excited and, and onboarded in the sense of um, transferring values and, and so on and so forth. Um, also about financial literacy and responsibility that comes with wealth. On the other side, it's also a mechanism and an opportunity for, for families to, to engage more passive family members because not everybody will have an active role in the family business. However, they, everybody can contribute in one way or another through philanthropy, and that is one way to, to, to make that happen. And, and really also to unify and to unite the family around, around a common goal or, or ambition. Um, then what I want to talk about briefly, and, and you know, that, that comes out quite clearly in, in the research that we do. We, we observe a number of major trends in philanthropy, and we sometimes talk about three waves of philanthropy. Well, the first wave was the traditional charitable giving that, that was done for, for centuries. Um, and, and then there was the era, which is kind of the second wave, the era of the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, who were very affluent families and they set up their foundations uh, to do good. And, and so there was an institutionalization effort of philanthropic activities that was going on. And now what we see is, and, and that is in part also triggered by digitalization in some form or shape or in many ways, as a matter of fact, because we see on the one side, and that's the third wave, the third philanthropic wave that we see on the one side, this rise of a new breed of mega donors. These are individuals who have built their wealth, not over generations, but over decades or sometimes just years. Um, you know, think about uh, Bill Gates and you see some of the people here, George Soros, uh, Zuckerberg, and, and the list goes on and on. There, there are many, many, many examples of, of individuals, many oftentimes tech entrepreneurs, but not only who have, who have accumulated a lot of wealth in a very short period of time, more wealth than they feel they should be controlling in the sense they say, we want to give back. And we don't just want to give back, we want to give back in a very specific way, which then comes to the spending down funds, the, the kind of trend on the, on the bottom left here, where, where we see, oops, apologies, where we see um, that, that families are, or individuals and philanthropists are, are essentially um, doing more of this spending down activity. So instead of having a perpetual fund and, and just kind of uh, investing the proceeds and the interest, they really say we spend down to tackle a specific cause. Um, that then immediately also links to, to the element of, of impact and, uh, and, and also to, to the element of, of focus on issues rather than uh, focus on places, where historically many families have been giving to places, places that they felt close to or related to, whereby now oftentimes they're, they're giving in order to tackle a specific issue that, that is troubling the world. Um, we see that there is a democratization of giving going on, again, triggered largely by technology and the internet and that we're all connected. So trends like crowdfunding, crowdsourcing, crowd lending, et cetera, all of these things where also small donors and, and individuals can, can, can make a contribution and collectively then, then come up with a, with a pre pretty decent sum. Um, then the other trends are in some way cohesive giving with cohesive giving and we'll get to that a bit later also uh, when we talk about Maria's case specifically, um, where it's really trying to tie in the activities that are going on in the business and the activities that are going on on the philanthropic side or the impact investing side or the CSR side. So that no longer it's, okay, here we make money and, and here we give back, but, but what is our bigger purpose and how can we essentially do good with a coherent strategy, giving strategy? And then lastly, uh, there, there are kind of next-gen related uh, trends. On the one side, next-gen moving into, into powerful positions. There's, there's massive transfer of wealth going on at the moment. And, and fundamentally, the digital natives, the millennials, 
have a mindset where they say we feel responsible and we want to be agents of change. So overall, as a result of this third wave of, of, of philanthropic revolution, so to say, um, we see that philanthropy is getting more organized and professionalized. And, and that has triggered us to start working on toolkits and frameworks that allow families to, to think about their philanthropic giving in a very structured, logical manner. So, so the toolkit that you see here is a toolkit that we've been working on it as a matter of fact, over the last two years, and which will be the essence of the book that we're publishing in October this year, which is the Family Philanthropy Navigator, where, you know, in some way inspired by tools like the Business Model Canvas from Alex Osterwalder or other similar tools, where, where we said we want to put together a toolkit that is, very, that is practical, fun, engaging, which allows families to essentially sit around a table and collectively define the, the purpose, the relationships, and how they want to do things. So essentially, the, the why are you giving? What is it that you're giving? Who is it that is giving? And, and how are you organizing your giving? And so, so this is, let's say, the core of um, the Navigator Toolkit that, that we have developed. And what is interesting, together with the Family Business Network, in, in the research project that we're conducting, where we've now spoken to over 60 uh, families from around the world through in-depth interviews, we, we started to realize that philanthropy is a, is, is a quite complex beast in some way. And there is no, there is no one size fits all. There, there is a multitude of ways how you can be philanthropically engaged. And, and there is no one right approach to giving, but there, there are many, many different facets of, of giving. And, and as a matter of fact, we found a lot of trade-offs that you don't have to read them out and we don't go into a lot of detail here, but you see a lot of trade-offs, for example, around the motivation. What inspires you or us to give and, and what drives us to give now, where, where some people are very much intrinsically driven and, and others are more extrinsically driven. Some are, are doing it. The motivation is because they want to unite the family. They want to educate the next generation. So there's a family first element to their giving. Others say, oh, we want to tie it in with, with our business activities. And, and for example, you have a pharmaceutical company. Uh, let's give to causes related to healthcare, for example, where there can be a strategic alliance in some way. Um, but also it could be that the cause is first, that you say, you know, I'm, I'm really troubled by a cer certain situation out there in the world, and, and my, my main ambition is to really tackle that issue in the world. So, so we see a lot of different patterns and hybrid solutions between these various trade-offs that enterprising families need to think about. And, and, and I think that is also the beauty um, of philanthropy that, that, again, there are so many ways um, how you can be philanthropically engaged and so many things you can do and, and also resources you can allocate. You know, we tend to think philanthropy is giving money, but it's not only that, it's, it's giving time, it's giving connections, it's leveraging your reputation out there in the world and, and, and trying to do things in a better way. So, so from that point of view, this is the essence of the work that we're doing and also in the research where we're trying to uncover philanthropic patterns and identities. And, and so, so it's my great pleasure to, to have Maria with us today because Maria has been um, a big supporter of our activities and, and a great partner also having contributed to, to this framework, having joined, as a matter of fact, the very first workshops we've been doing on this quite a while ago, um, joined our workshops, challenged us, and, and as I said, is also one of the cases we're featuring the book. So, so it's, it's an immense pleasure to, to have you with us, Maria. And um, what, we, what we want to do now is that, that Maria will briefly introduce her philanthropic work uh, around the Eva Alström Foundation, introduce her family and the work around the Eva Alström Foundation. And, and, and then we'll kind of go through a range of questions. And then if you have specific questions, either to, to any of the trends or the toolkit or, or to Maria specifically, just put them into the Q&A, please. Maria, over to you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's been an immense pleasure to 
to work with IMD and with Peter and his team on this family navigator. And uh, I've had a lot of use of it. It's been really good. So let's see how I do today because I've filled out the navigator and um, we'll see how I do. Anyway, we're going to start with um, a short introduction. So I'm a member of the Alstrom family and we are quite a large industrial family dating back to 1851. And we are 420 family members over seven generations of which I represent the fifth. We have a global company based in Finland with roots in the forest industry. Although today we are mostly in fiber-based materials and industrial technology. We employ roughly 15,000 people in 29 countries with a net revenue of around five uh, billion euros. And uh, we don't necessarily believe in charity or old cliches like doing good or giving back. We sincerely believe in doing the right thing according to universal values, such as honesty, empathy, respect, and justice. Simplified, I personally believe in, in being a decent human being and always strive to be the best version of myself. But unfortunately, a good heart and doing the right thing will not change our societies nor the world. We need action, we need collaboration, and we, re we need real change for our family vision, a better world for future generations to become reality. And to heed this, my female cousins and I founded the Eva Astrom Foundation in 2010 to support society's most vulnerable, women and children. And our aim is to spark change by advocating for compassion and action to change attitudes and structures in society. So that's the background. Super, thanks a lot, Maria. So, so I suggest we, we kind of go through um, kind of the three pillars of, of the navigator. And, and in particular, let's get started uh, with the purpose. So essentially the motivation. Um, so, so why is it that you decided to give and, and, and why at that point? Uh, what is it that you're focusing on? So the focus part of, of your giving, what areas, what domains, and, and also kind of the ambitions you have through your giving. What is it you would like to achieve? So if you could please share a bit more about the purpose of, of your and your family's giving. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'll start with my great, great grandparents, Eva and Antti Astrem, who were front runners in their time in the 1800s. They believed in, in uh, equal opportunities for girls and boys. That wasn't common at that time. They built hospitals, schools, and libraries in the communities where they had businesses and encouraged families to send also their girls to school. And uh, they, my great grandparents, they also believed that for your business to thrive, you do need to take care of the community your business resides in. My personal first memories about my role in society is from when I'm about five years old. And my father bought ice cream for me and my siblings from an ice cream stand. And I asked, if you're a king, father, can you eat all the ice cream in the world? And my father answered, yes, you probably can. But if you're a really good king, you would probably teach the children how to make ice cream. And then kings and children everybody can eat ice cream together. And that's when I, for the first time, realized as a five-year-old that, huh, if you have power, you can use it to benefit just yourself or to benefit many. And then a few years later, there was a dangerous slide on the playground where we used to play. It was broken. And I went home and asked my father to help me repair it. And he said, no, it's your playground, you fix it. And I argued, you know, I'm nine years old, I don't have the skills to repair a slide. And, and he said, 
Well, you know, you just have to use the skills you have. You know how to write, don't you? Why don't you write to the president? And being nine years old, I thought, okay, that sounds logic. So I did. And to my parents' surprise, I got an answer from the president and um, they did repair the slide. And the point with my story is that my father's point was that if something is important to you, you need to act. You cannot expect anybody else to do it on your behalf. And I think this is so true. And also Martin Luther King defined power as the possibility to affect change. And I sincerely believe that we need to reactivate our collective power to affect the changes we want to see in today's world. Well then, about 15 years ago, the Alstom company was looking for new business opportunities and better profits in the emerging markets. And as, as we, the women in the family, discussed the reasons behind these, the, these investments, such as low cost of production, lower wages, we were reminded of what our parents and grandparents had told us, that a company can only prosper and thrive if the community it, it resides in is well taken care of. And that we had a responsibility to act and actually had the collective power to affect change. So was it time for us to do the same? to follow in our grandparents' footsteps. And that's how we, the women in the fifth generation in the Alstrom family, we decided to act and start the Eva Alstrom Foundation in our great grandmother's name to support society's most vulnerable women and children, locally and globally, preferably where the Alstrom family had businesses, activity or history. And our ambition was, and still is, to inspire and engage our family, our networks, and society as a whole, and to use our collective power to drive change. And as a foundation, we don't believe in charity, but see our donations as investments in the future of humanity. And we also want to be a foundation with a twist where our impact is measured not only by our monetary contributions or on the impact of our implementing partners, but also on how well we succeed in inspiring and engaging our community at large. And to do this, we have initiated various collaborations of different shapes and different sizes with families, companies and organizations coming together, of which the biggest was called Together and joined together 42 Finnish family companies in supporting the Syrian children through UNICEF. And that was really a great, I know that many of my colleagues from this is on the call, so hello to you all, Together people. And um, lastly, our ambition, as we believe in the power of collaboration, I'm super excited to share with you that we are just about to launch our biggest collaboration to date, a bold international initiative called Alström Collective Impact, consisting of companies, foundations and stakeholders within the Alström network that through its global partnership with UNICEF will add value to the purpose as well as business value to Alström network companies with the ambition to achieve significant change in the global society. That's our ambition. Super. No, super, super fascinating. Thanks a lot for sharing uh, also a bit of the background of, of what led you to, to actually start your philanthropic work and journey in some way. Um, also, I, I've made a mental note about the, the collective impact because I think this is, this is something super interesting and that relates to this coherence trend that, that I was talking about earlier, 
Um, let's get back to that um, at, at a later point in time because I think uh, this is this is a very timely topic and also approach that you're taking there. Um, let's quickly move on to to the second pillar, which is the relationship. So on the one side within the family, uh, and on the other side the ecosystem around you, so partner organizations and individuals. So can you can you share a bit? Um, you know how do you involve others from the family? How what are means and ways how they can actually contribute to your giving? Is it an open activity or is it, is it more selective who from the family can be involved? How many of your family members are involved? But also how do you, how do you orchestrate fundamentally a bit your ecosystem? And, and also, you know, what has been some of the effects of philanthropy on your family after having started the philanthropic work and involving uh, so, some of your cousins and siblings, uh, etc. Yes, I mean, absolutely. For us, um, we had many we had many different reasons for for starting the foundation, but definitely, family unity and family involvement was one of the biggest drivers when we started the foundation, because, like many of you probably know, in a big family of four hundred plus, naturally. Not everyone is interested, interested in or, or has the qualifications needed for the family business. And I'm a nurse by profession. And um, I feel strongly as, as humans and as family members, a profound need is the need to belong. And that is why we felt it was important to create possibilities for everyone interested to contribute to the foundation and the family brand without having to be involved in the business itself. And uh, the foundation is primarily run by a board of eight family members, of, of which I'm the chair. And for the first six years, it was a board of women only. But today, we strive for diversity in age as well as gender, as the foundation is, has become something that the whole family feels very connected to. So even if it started as a girl power thing 10 years ago, and it really united the, the women in our family, it really did. I think everybody who's an Eva feels that very strongly. But we can't exclude the boys because they have the same vision and, and uh, wants as we, we women do. So they have now joined the whole community and, and the foundation. And uh, to engage as many family members as possible, we have formed different committees within the EVA ecosystem, like you said, as um, EVA Invest. It's a separate investment committee where we've taken uh, actually male, male um, bankers from our family who, who do the investing for us. EVA International, who is uh, for family members living outside Finland. We have EVA Youth for the youngsters. EVA Elder, Elders is an advisory um, committee, EVA events, and so on and so on. Uh, and all these groups, they dedicate their time and their skills to the foundation pro bono. And I must say, it, it does feel really good and, and somehow right when, when different generations come together and create something new from shared heritage and values. And it's something very special when you have three generations coming together and working for the same cause. It feels really good. And as one of our mission is to inspire and engage society to act, a lot of our time is actually used modeling different ways and opportunities to contribute, which is, which is actually quite time consuming, but the results and the impact really makes a difference. And in the end, so society's most vulnerable don't care who or where, where the help comes from. What matters is that it does. And that's why we want to inspire and activate everyone with power to affect change. And regarding our partners, I want to be honest with you and confess that after we started the foundation, we, the women in the fifth generation, we realized that we did have the vision, we did have the energy, we did have a big heart, 
but actually very little money and no real expertise. None of us had any, any expertise, especially in how to solve the world's problems. And we realized very early on that we needed a partner who had the power to implement our vision. And luckily, we very early on identified UNICEF, UN's children organization, as our main partner. Because thanks to the UN mandate, UNICEF has direct access to governments and local officials that other organizations don't, which makes UNICEF's work grounded in existing political realities and the work sustainable and scalable. So for us, it was a perfect match. So UNICEF uh, is our main partner. Super, no, very helpful, thanks. Um, as we move into the third kind of bucket, the organization part uh, of your giving, I'm also reading some of the questions that are, that are popping up here. And, and there are a number of questions related to, as a matter of fact, this piece and around governance. So, so one of the questions here is, can the next generation board members actually change the focus and cause of the support? There are questions around, how do you set up your annual budget um, of the funds? Uh, and also, uh, um, is it an endowment fund? So I think those questions very neatly relate to, to the third piece, the organization section. So, so could you explain a bit more, you know, how you are organizing your philanthropic work in terms of resource allocation? So um, human resource, social resource, financial resources that you devote to this giving. Um, and also, you know, from a governance point of view, and, and, and lastly, also in terms of kind of impact and, and learning activities that you embrace. Um, and I think, yeah, a number of questions are, are relating to that. So I think you can probably touch on a number of those. Yes. So, so most of our funding comes from within the Austrian network. And uh, the grants or our partnerships that we, when we support them, it's really the value increase of our portfolio. That's how we, we uh, maintain those. So we, it's not like we have X amount of money and then we just pay it out and then we don't have anything left. It's the, the value increase, increase of our portfolio that we, that we grant. But, um, and and um, we, we actually don't, because uh, I know it's also always this question about donations and who do you support and so on. And, and for us, it's very important that we don't see our donations as invest, uh, we do see our donations as investments. And we like to differentiate between charity and strategic giving. Because in our opinion, charity is often based on an emotion rather than knowledge and does not necessarily yield to any real results. While strategic giving defines a problem, solves it, and scales up the results for sustainable impact. So we see our donations to UNICEF as investments, and we expect the same ROI from our investments in UNICEF as from any business investment. The difference being that we don't expect a direct monetary return on an investment in child protection, education, or building strong institutions. Instead, the return comes in in form of a safe child who grows up to be a responsible adult, who in the future will contribute to his community so that families and businesses and, and communities alike can prosper and thrive. And, and for us, investing in, investing in child protection must be the right thing to do because if we do not protect the children to whom we are leaving this world, then what's the point of life? And if basically good men and women do not stand up for what is right, then who will? And if now is not the, the right time to act, when is? So these are very much how we reason around these things. Then regarding the setup and the governance, the board of the foundation is composed of family members only. We have an application process where we had defined certain requirements in terms of skills and the time you need to set aside. 
we have a board term of three years and we encourage no more than 10 to 12 years on the board as to get rotations. And since March, we have a part-time assistant, but apart from that, all work is done pro bono by family members. And we have divided the work amongst us through working groups and assigned responsibilities that go with our skills. So we have the financial, we have communication, events, and so on. And then of course our different partners, which is a very important part, both the collaborations and the partners. We meet officially every six weeks for a four hour board meeting, but we are in contact, contact almost daily. So it's a, it's a, because we do so much, um, there's a lot to do. It's a small organization, organization already. And uh, together with our implementing partners, we define uh, KPIs for each investment or donation, and that we follow up with yearly written reports. And hugely popular and enlightening uh, field visits and a continuing active dialogue. So we have a very active dialogue with our partners. And our very hands-on approach and, and strong involvement has been very appreciated by our partners, who in turn educate and keep us informed, which allows us for, to serve as ambassadors and to advocate for the causes that we support. And as an example, we have been invited to serve on the UNICEF International Council with UNICEF's biggest private partners. This is a forum where we learn and get first-hand information, exchange experiences and ideas with like-minded partners and have the possibility to influence UNICEF's work at the highest level. So, so maybe if I can chip in, because I see a lot of interesting questions popping up also related to, to the governance, to the funding piece and um, some related to the board, for example, Marianne asked, you know, what is the reason for not having non-family members on the board? Um, is this something that just for now is a status quo and is this going to change or? Uh, family members, uh, in-laws are, ah, okay, sorry. So in-laws are family members. So it's, we wanted to keep it as, for now, as a family foundation. For now, we can do it with ourselves. Of course, if the foundation grows and if we don't have the expertise within the 400, 420 of us, then we will have to re-evaluate. But for the moment, we're okay like this. So no. yes, I mean, if, if we're, we get to that point, we don't have the expertise ourselves, then we will have to rethink. Yeah. And there are a number of questions in terms of budget and funding. Is the contribution into the, fund, in the, into the foundation each family member individually, or is it also through the company that you allocate a certain profit share into the foundation annually, or how, how does it work? And also, do you take outside funding outside the family or not? We, we take any funding. We take funding from, from outside, but it tends to be family-oriented. So families, everything is voluntary, both for family members and for our companies. So we might apply from the AGM, for example, for an amount or from a company, but it's, it's voluntary for anybody, for the companies and for family members to contribute. And the, the, the donations go into our portfolio and then we invest the money and with the proceeds, we, we do our work. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. There are um, a number of questions uh, around how do you get started? Then there are some related to um, Asia, for example, Eddie uh, is asking, you know, family philanthropy is still in its infancy stage in Southeast Asia. There are not a lot of wealthy families who, who have this kind of structure set up. So, so essentially, how can you encourage families to, to start giving? And, and I think it's not only Asia specific. I think there were a, a few other questions. How do you get started? I think essentially, uh, this can be for, for any type of family that would like to get started. What would be your kind of advice to get started with a philanthropic journey? I think uh, if you're a family, I, th I think to find the common, the common, the things that you all hold dear, some common history or some common interest or whatever it can be that you can all identify with. 
and, and all find that, hey, yes, this is us. This is us. I, I, you know, great-grandparents uh, loved soccer, and we all love soccer or sports. So let's, let's support support, something that you can all unify around. I think that's important. But I also want to say that I think it's very important to engage everybody to really, because like I said, I, I, I wanted to belong and I was a nurse and I couldn't really contribute to the family business or anything that we had because I don't have the skills. But, but through the foundation, it has really uh, changed my life in the sense that also my, the way I view myself and my self, maybe not self-respect, but you know, the self-view, if, I don't know if that's a word in English, but yeah. You mentioned the importance of engaging others. And, and in fact, um, one of the questions here is, you know, how do you engage 400 plus family members in something? I know you started with a small group of, of kind of close circle uh, sparring partners, but, but now I think essentially this is also part of the glue connecting the family. Um, so, so, so how do you do this? Any, any tricks about that? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's just continuous work. Every time we had the possible, because we were 25 women who started and we are 420. So we just, we started, I think, to create different um, uh, activities that people find interesting. We, we had a lot of different peop uh, people coming to talk about different subjects. We wanted to raise awareness and we were just trying to be good at what we did and did what we believed in and, and through that and engaged people. So always if somebody said, you know, oh, that sounds interesting, we jumped on it and said, hey, would you like to take part in this or that? And also I've, sometimes I've even tried to create different groups or things just to get people involved. And it doesn't mean that everybody wants to sit, be on the board and, and, and spend as this much time as I do on this, but, you know, maybe even to give one or two days a year, but you feel connected. Yeah, I did my part. And I know I have a lot of cousins here on the, on the call as well, who I'm sure can identify and say, yeah, I always do the, the music at our events. I'm definitely an Eva, I'm, I'm taking part. I'm a musician and this is what I do. This is my way of contributing. There, there are a number of questions around KPIs and impact. Um, one was related to the Syrian refugee camps, but also some questions were more, more broadly phrased. Um, how do you go about, I mean, A, do you measure the impact of your giving in some way? And if yes, how um, on the specific projects you support? For us, it's the implementing partner. So the implementing partner does all the assessment and reports back to us on the project. Definitely, so UNICEF does that or whoever else we, we partner with. The only thing that we can, well, we have KPIs also for, uh, for example, you know, if we do this project and we engage these families, will this and this happen? And then Austrian Collective Impact, for example, it has been an investment in 10 years to get seven companies to join together, you know, so it's, this is how we measure it. How many family companies can we get to give to whatever cost they, they choose? Or usually UNICEF, which is our biggest partner. Yeah, okay. So, so um, also a bit aware of time, and there are two more things I really, really want to talk about. On the one side, it's the uh, Alstrom Collective Impact uh, piece. And, and second, there are also a number of questions about you know, what are your learnings? What's your advice? What are your recommendations for, for either novice philanthropists or philanthropists who want to somehow get more organized or structured in their giving? But let's maybe start with the Alstrom Collective Impact. Can you, can you briefly talk about that? What is it? It's relatively new and, and I find it reasonably exciting uh, because I, you don't see that very often to have such a cohesive strategy uh, around doing good. So, so can, can you share a bit about that? Right, right. so it's, it's basically within the Alstrom network, we have a family office, we have four foundations, we have a bunch of companies, seven, eight, depending how you define them. And uh, we're trying to get all these together. Not all of them are from the start, but 
We have five companies joining. We have one foundation. We have the family office. So we are trying together to, 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 to define and, and use our strengths and the synergies to have a bigger collective voice and also to be a role model for many other companies and families because there's not really that many initiatives like this. And one part of this is also to have a shareholder social responsibility or stakeholder social responsibilities. We want to give employees or board members or executives the possibility to, to contribute to this collective impact. So we're trying to get all different stakeholders within the Alstom network to, to give to the same cause. Yeah. Okay. This, so this year, this year we are supporting COVID, the work which is quite natural, the work around COVID. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was also one of the questions that that came up. If if there is something very specific you are doing or doing differently as as a family, as a business, uh, through your philanthropic side, as a result of the current crisis, can, can you elaborate on that a bit more? Because I know you've been doing a number of things um, in in that domain. Well, uh, as, as a foundation, as I represent the foundation really here mostly, as a foundation we've, we've uh, um, supported UNICEF's work in COVID through this Alstom Collective Impact. And, uh, and our company, some of our companies, Alstom Munche and Suominen, they have, as they are in speciality paper, they have changed their production and they are now producing, you know, masks and, and things for, for the COVID. So they changed the production, but they, they had the expertise already in speciality paper. Okay, so on the one side, through the foundation side, but also also on the business side, um, I think this is, this is good, yeah. Um, aware of time, I think, you know, what, what is always really important um, is, and one of the questions was also, um, I think it was, uh, I don't, the name is not showing, but the question says, if you can turn back the clock by a decade, is there anything you would have done differently? Which I think essentially is also what we've been asking you for the case study in the book. What would be your advice to yourself 10 years ago uh, when you're just kind of starting off with your philanthropic project? Any lessons learned, any mistakes on the way that you said, oh, if somebody had told me this, that would have been amazing. Anything you could or would like to share? Uh, I, I think, I wish we had in a way communicated clear, more clearly what we were trying to do. But it is possible also as we, we just, you know, we just started with such a force that we, we now see so clearly what it is we're doing and what we want to achieve. But we maybe weren't so clear at that time. But I wish we had somehow community, communicated more clearly what we wanted to achieve so as to get the family on board faster. But at the same time, um, through this, yeah, so I, I wish that. Maybe communicating more clearly and uh, not be, and of course, believing in yourself, but we did believe in ourselves. We, we formed such a strong bond, the women in the family, that um, kind of worth it as well to do it just like that. But, but I would say that a key learning is that, that, um, that we have formed such a strong family identity around doing the right thing. You know, uh, because the challenge for, for us multi-generational families and, and big family companies in general is that you easily become faceless and nobody really knows who the company represents and what the shareholders stand for. But through the foundation and, and now through the Alstom Collective Impact, we as family members and, and as shareholders, we can demonstrate our values. And through our actions, we can also communicate who we are and what we stand for. So for me, you know, the Eva Alstom Foundation, uh, we have succeeded in, in what we wanted to do because we wanted to create the strong and positive family identity that our children can be proud of and that they in turn will want to uphold and by continuing the family business. So, so it is, the, is, is the 
next generation already actively involved uh, in your foundation work as well? Absolutely. We have this EVA youth, yeah. youth group and, and definitely, definitely. And also the board is actually quite young. So I'm super old. The rest are much younger, which is, which is great. Okay. So, so 20 years like, my junior. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Um, so, so, so there are a lot more, many, many, many more questions here, which I, I'm afraid we will not really be able to um, pick up all of them. Let me just quickly check. So, so the next gen, I think there is an interesting one here about um, decision making. Uh, there are a number of questions around decision making, how you take decisions inside the foundation um, for your activities. Is it through the board or also how does this Alstrom Collective Impact come in? How do you coordinate with other ent entities within your network? Yeah, yeah, within the foundation board, we take the decisions there. But um, Alstrom Collective Impact has a steering committee where each company has one representative on the board and then we have a chair. So we take it as a collective, but one representative per company. And then we have, and UNICEF is actually also on the steering committee. So they are working with us on the steering committee. Fantastic. Yeah, but let's see, we, we, we are just about to, to start. So ask me in one year how we, how we did. We will for sure. So, so there are many, many more questions, which I think we will need to kind of take uh, afterwards. I mean, we can keep track of those. To all of you, if you have additional questions to uh, Maria or myself or both of us, um, please do feel free to reach out. Um, you will, of course, receive the recording of the webinar, um, which you can then uh, take a look at and also share in your network. You see contact details here of myself and Maria. Um, reach out if you have any questions. This would be amazing to stay in touch also through LinkedIn or if you send us an email. Um, and, and any questions you might have around getting started on philanthropy or professionalizing philanthropy or lessons learned from Maria's side or ad advice. I think, Maria, I, from what I understood, you're also very open and willing to, to have people reach out to you and, and same on my side. So um, with that, I think we would like to close the webinar. Thank you so much for everybody for participating, for the lively discussions, for all the questions, great questions that you've been asking. Thank you, Maria, for um, sharing your story and, and for being so open and uh, um, good luck with the next couple of years. I think you, you have great ambitions and uh, yeah, everybody stay healthy and uh, we'll be in touch soon again. Take good care. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.